In the words of the great Bullwinkle J. Moose, hello, poetry lovers. This film is a Dylan Thomas short story, which I made into a movie twice, both times to the wonderful reading by Reverend William Davies, who had been du Dean of the Duke Chapel and whom I discovered in the early 70s in some upper haunt of that building. He knew Dylan Thomas personally. In fact, Dylan Thomas had stayed with him and his wife when he appeared at Duke in 1964. He was a Welshman himself, and he had a tremendous feeling for the Dylan Thomas. And, of course, a beautiful voice, and I think you can hear it in this recording. Uh, in any event, I set it to two pieces of simple piano music by Franz Liszt, Nuage Gris and the Lugubrious Gondola. I'm not sure which one comes first, but I just played them back to back twice to William Davis's very interesting um, reading and um, shot the movie uh, twice. This is the second version, which I did years later. And... Um, but uh, and I'll probably do it again because it has to do with uh, a lot with uh, Thomas's idea of growing old and confronting the forces of nature and spirit as that happens. Uh, so, enemies from adventures in the skin trade. It was morning in the green acres of the Jarvis Valley, and Mr. Owen was picking the weeds from the edges of his garden path. A great wind pulled at his hair. The vegetable world roared under his feet. A rook had lost itself in the sky and was making a noise to its mate, but the mate never came, and a rook flew into the west with a woe in its beak. Mr. Owen, who had stood up to ease his shoulders and look at the sky, observed how dark the wings beat against the red sun. In her drafty kitchen, Mrs. Owen grieved over the soup. Once in past days, the valley had housed the cattle alone. The farm boys came down from the hills to hollow at the cattle and to drive them to be milked. But no stranger set foot in the valley. Mr. Owen, walking lonely through the country, had come upon it at the end of a late summer evening when the cattle were lying down still and the stream that divided it was speaking over the pebbles. Here thought Mr. Owen, I will build a small house in the middle of the valley, set around by a garden. And remembering clearly the way he had come along the winding hills, he returned to his village and the questions of Mrs. Owen. So it came about that a house was built in the green fields. The garden was dug and planted, and a low fence put up around the garden to keep the cows from the vegetables. That was early in the year. Now summer and autumn had gone over. The garden had blossomed and died. There was frost at the weeds. Mr. Owen bent down again, tidying the path, while the wind blew back the heads of the nearby grasses and made an oracle of each green mouth. Patiently he strangled the weeds. <laughs> 
up came the roots, making war in the soil around them. Insects were busy in the holes where the weeds had sprouted, but dying between his fingers, they left no stain. He grew tired of their death and tired of the fall of the weeds. Up came the roots, down went the cheap green heads. Mrs. Owen, peering into the depths of her crystal, had left the soup to bubble on unaided. The ball grew dark, then lightened as a rainbow moved within it. Growing hot like a sun and cooling again like an arctic star, it shone in the folds of her dress where she held it lovingly. The tea leaves in a cup at breakfast had told of a dark stranger. What would the crystal tell her? Mrs. Owen wondered. Up came the roots and the crooked worm, disturbed by the probing of the fingers, wriggled blind in the sun. Of a sudden, the valley filled all its hollows with the wind, with the voice of the roots, with the breathing of the nether sky. Not only a mandrake screams, torn roots have their cries, each weed Mr. Owen pulled out of the ground screamed like a baby. In the village behind the hill, the wind would be raging. The clothes on the garden lines would be set to strange dances. And women with shapes in their wombs would feel a new knocking as they bent over the steamy tubs. Life would go on in the veins, in the bones, the binding flesh that had their seasons and their weathers, even as the valley binding the house about with the flesh of the green grass. The ball, like an open grave, gave up its dead to Mrs. Owen. She stared on the lips of women and the hairs of men that wound into a pattern on the face of the crystal world. But suddenly, the patterns were swept away and she could see nothing but the shapes of the Jarvis hills. A man with a black hat was walking down the paths into the invisible valley beneath. If he walked any nearer, he would fall into her lap. There's a man with a black hat walking on the hills, she called through the window. Mr. Owen smiled and went on weeding. It was at this time that the Reverend Mr. Davies lost his way. He had been losing it most of the morning, but now he had lost it altogether and stood perturbed under a tree on the rim of the Jarvis Hills. A great wind blew through the branches and a great grey-green earth moved unsteadily beneath him. Wherever he looked, the hills stormed up to the sky. Wherever he sought to hide from the wind, he was frightened by the darkness. The farther he walked, the stranger was the scenery around him. It rose to undreamed of heights and fell down again into a valley no bigger than the palm of his hand. And the trees walked like men. By a divine coincidence, he reached the rim of the hills just as the sun reached the center of the sky. With a wide world rocking from horizon to horizon, he stood under a tree and looked down into the valley. In the fields was a little house with a garden. The valley roared around it. The wind leapt at it like a boxer, but the house stood still. To Mr. Davies, it seemed as though the house had been carried out of the village by a large bird and placed in the very middle of the tumultuous universe. But as he climbed over the craggy edges and down the side of the hill, he lost his place in Mrs. Owen's kiss. A cloud displaced his black hat, and under the cloud walked a very old phantom, a shape of air with stars all frozen in its beard and a half moon for a smile. 
Mr. Davies knew nothing of this as the briars scratched his hands. He was old. He was drunk with the wine of the morning. But the stuff that came out of his cuts was a human blood. Nor did Mr. Owen, with his face near the soil and his hands on the necks of the screaming weeds, know of the transformation in the crystal. He had heard Mrs. Owen prophesy the coming of the black hat, and had smiled as he always smiled at her face in the powers of darkness. He had looked up when she called, and smiling, had returned to the clearer call of the ground. Multiply, multiply, he had said to the worms disturbed in their channeling, and had cut the brown worms in half, so that the halves might breed and spread their life over the garden and go out, contaminating into the fields and the bellies of the cattle. Of this Mr. Davies knew nothing. He saw a young man bent industriously over the garden soil. He saw that the house was a pretty picture, with the face of a pale young woman pressed up against the window. And removing his black hat, he introduced himself as the rector of a village some ten miles away. You are bleeding, said Mr. Rowan. Mr. Davy's hands indeed were covered in blood. When Mrs. Rowan had seen to the rector's cuts, she sat him down in the armchair near the window and made him a strong cup of tea. I saw you on the hill, she said, and he asked her how she had seen him, for the hills are high and a long way off. I have got good eyes, she answered. He did not doubt her. Her eyes were the strangest he had seen. It is quiet here, said Mr. Davies. We have no clock, she said, and laid the table for three. You are very kind. We are kind to those that come to us, she said. He wondered how many came to the lonely house in the valley, but did not question her for fear of what she would reply. He guessed she was an uncanny woman, loving the dark because it was dark. He was too old to question the secrets of darkness, and now, with a black suit torn and wet, and his thin hands bound with the bandages of the stranger woman, he felt older than ever. The winds of the morning might blow him down, and the sudden dropping of the dark be blind in his eyes. Rain might pass through him as it passes through the body of a ghost, a tired, white-haired old man, he sat under the window, almost invisible against the panes and the white cloth of the chair. Soon the meal was ready, and Mr. Owen came in and washed from the garden. Shall I say grace? asked Mr. Davies when all three were seated around the table. Mrs. Owen nodded. O Lord God Almighty, bless this our meal, said Mr. Davies. Looking up as he continued his prayer, he saw that Mr. and Mrs. Owen had closed their eyes. We thank thee for the bounties that thou hast given us. And he saw that the lips of Mr. and Mrs. Owen were moving softly. He could not hear what they said, but he knew that the prayers they spoke were not his prayers. Amen, said all three together. Mr. Owen, proud in his eating, bent over the plate as he had bent over the complaining weeds. Outside the window was the brown body of the earth, the green skin of the grass, and the breasts of the Jarvis hills. There was a wind that chilled the animal earth, and a sun that had drunk up the dews on the field. There was creation sweating out of the pores of the trees, and the grains of the sand on faraway seashores would be multiplying as the sea rolled over them. He felt the coarse foods on his tongue. There was a meaning in the rind of the meat 
and the purpose in the lifting of food to the mouth, he saw with a sudden satisfaction that Mrs. Owen's throat was bare. She too was bent over her plate, but was letting the teeth of her fork nibble at the corners of it. She did not eat, for the old powers were upon her, and she dared not lift up her head for the greenness of her eyes. She knew by the sound which way the wind blew in the valley. She knew the stage of the sun by the curve of the shadows and the cloth. Oh, that she could take a crystal and see within it the stretches of darkness covering up this winter light. But there was a darkness gathering in her mind, drawing in the light around her. There was a ghost on her right. With all her strength, she drew in the intangible light that moved around him and mixed it in her dark brains. Mr. Davies, like a man sucked by a bird, felt desolation in his veins, and in a sweet delirium told of his adventures on the hills, how it had been cold and blowing, and how the hills went up and down. He had been lost, he said, and had found a dark retreat to shelter from the bullies in the wind. The darkness had frightened him, and he had walked again on the hills where the morning tossed about him like a ship on the sea. Wherever he went, he was blown in the open or frightened in the narrow shades. There was nowhere, he said pityingly, for an old man to go. Loving his parish, he had loved the surrounding lands, but the hills had given under his feet or plunged him into the air. And loving his God, he had loved the darkness where men of old had worshipped the dark invisible. But now the hill caves were full of shapes and voices that mocked him because he was old. He is frightened of the dark, thought Mr. Owen, the lovely dark. With a smile, Mr. Owen thought, he is frightened of the worm in the earth, of the copulation in the tree, of the living grease in the soil. They looked at the old man and saw that he was more ghostly than ever. The window behind him cast a ragged circle of light round his head. Suddenly, Mr. Davies knelt down to pray. He did not understand the cold in his heart, nor the fear that bewildered him as he knelt. But speaking his prayers for deliverance, he stared up at the shadowed eyes of Mrs. Owen and at the smiling eyes of her husband, kneeling on the carpet at the head of the table. He stared in bewilderment at the dark mind and the gross, dark body. He stared and he prayed like an old god beset by his enemies.